Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of DS3. Today I'm really excited to have uh, Kathleen Fisher speak about a topic that's been very much at the top of my mind recently, that's uh, high assurance input validation. Uh, Kathleen's research uh, over uh, several decades has focused on advancing the theory and practice of programming languages. She's currently the chair of of the computer science department at Tufts University and previously she was a program manager at DARPA where she started and managed the HACMS and PPAML programs and before that uh, she was a principal member of the technical staff at AT&T Labs Research. Kathleen, Kathleen's a, a fellow of the Association of uh, Computing Machinery, the ACM, and a Hertz Foundation fellow. Thank you for presenting today Kathleen. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. Uh, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about locking the front door, high assurance input validation. Um, as we know, cybersecurity is a really hard problem with significant negative personal, financial, national security ramifications for getting it wrong. And part of the reason why it's hard is that defenders have to lock every door, whereas defenders, every door, every window, et cetera, whereas defenders only have to find one way in. Um, but protecting against malicious program inputs, well, that's the equivalent of locking the front door. But according to DARPA's SafeDocs broad agency announcement, the BAA, 80% of the issues in MITRE's common vulnerabilities and exposure database involve input validation failure. So we're not even properly locking the front door. So I wanna dive into that in the next hour. So I wanna start by doing some post-incident analyses. What's caused recent parsing related exploits and what can we learn from th those analyses? So I wanna start with the Heartbleed um, incident. So Heartbleed took place or was discovered in 2014 and the Heartbleed incident allowed silent exfiltration of sensitive information. So one of the bad things about uh, Heartbleed was that the attack didn't leave any trace in any kind of log file. The information just got exfiltrated. Um, an analysis that was done shortly after the fact and was published in the matter of Heartbleed uh, calculated that there were up to 55% of the Alexa top 1 million websites were actually vulnerable to this, uh, to this attack. So what was the root cause of Heartbleed? So the OpenSSL uh, library, the implementation of the TLS heartbeat protocol extension, it failed to properly validate the padding length field. So if we look, can you see the, if I point in the mouse over here? Yes, yes, we can see cool. that. So we, here this struct is the format of the heartbeat message. So it starts out with a type um, and then it has the length of the payload and then it actually has the payload. And here we have a dependency where the data field payload, the actual length depends upon the payload length field, which was just right before which is a common idiom in um, packet format kind of uh, data messages. And then we have the padding field, padding. And now padding is also a dependent field. Its length is specified by the padding length field. But unlike the payload length, the padding length is not immediately proceeding. In fact, the specification is relatively complex. It says the padding length field must be at least 16 and it has to be equal to TLS plain text dot length minus payload length minus three if the packet is in is a TLS packet. If it's a DTLS plain text packet though, it must be DTLS plain text minus length minus payload length minus three. So it's a relatively complex calculation and the particular impl uh, open SSL implementation got it wrong. And so the, the check wasn't done and the attacker could supply packets that um, caused the system to think the length was wrong and use a much bigger length and return results that uh, included information way beyond the actual length that they were supposed to be returned and then um, steal whatever information happened to be in that larger extent. extent. So the problems here was that the, the actual parser implementation was wrong. It failed to detect an error in the packets that were coming from an untrusted source. And arguably the specification um, of the packet format was too complicated. It was too easy to make this kind of a mistake. Then another example is the PPP daemon RCE vulnerability. So PPP is the point-to-point -point protocol that's used to establish internet connections over dial-up modems, DSL connections, and other point-to-point -point links on, on Linux. Um, this vulnerability allowed an attacker to establish remote code execution. It affected um, all PPT, PPP, PPP daemon versions 2.4.2 to 2.4.8. That was 17 years worth of the PPP daemon 
um, on, on Linux. And an attacker could trigger this vulnerability by sending an unsolicited packet. So you could just send the packet that was malformed that was in the extensible authentication protocol EAP to a vulnerable client or server. And the problem here was that the EAP request and the EAP response functions, so these functions had to parse these packets coming from the outside world, they failed to validate the size of the input before copying the supplied data into memory. So this is an example like the heartbeat case where the packet format had a length dependency in it and the parser failed to detect this error condition. Um, it's possible that in this case, like the Hartley case, the specification was too complicated or it could just be a, a simple error. The next case I wanna talk about is the, the cloud bleed uh, case. So cloud bleed is the vulnerability associated with the Cloudflare content distribution network. This vulnerability, um, uh, this mistake resulted in exfiltrating encryption keys, cookies, passwords, and other sensitive information from uh, web content that was hosted or, you know, content that was hosted in the Cloudflare um, content distribution network. The, mis the mistake was actually found by Google Project Zero people who were just looking at logs and started to, to see all sorts of sensitive information. Um, and then the Google Project Zero people worked with the, the tech support people at Cloudflare to figure out what actually was happening. Um, here, the, um, the Cloudflare uh, uh, web content people were parsing the web content using a, a regular expression um, library code and the, the, the Regal tool. And the, they're very careful to say that the bug was not in the Regal, uh, regular expression library tool. Um, the, the Regal code was um, uh, had checked to see whether the um, the pointer was still within the buffer of legal data, but the, the check that was being used was, was the pointer equal to the end of the buffer? So it was like advancing a, uh, a pointer through the buffer and checking to see, you know, is the buffer, is the pointer that's being advanced equal to the end of the buffer or not? And it stopped when it got equal to the end of the buffer, not, it wasn't checking to see, was it less than or equal to the end of the buffer that was still in the valid range. And what happened was the way that the, the content, the Cloudflare people were using the library they um, incremented the pointer beyond the end of the range. And so the, the regular expression library code didn't notice that the buffer was no longer in the range and just happily kept going, zooming past the end of the content. And that resulted in returning way more than it was supposed to be returned. Um, and that then got this sensitive data actually um, uh, sent to Google for recording instead of um, uh, kept secret. So here the code, so it, this would only trigger in cases where the data had a, a, a mistake in it. So the, the code in the, the red, the yellow uh, box here is an example of the kind of input that would trigger this mistake where there's an opening bracket, but no closing bracket. And the, the regular expression parsing code, which is shown in the blue box here, the, um, the at code is the code this line here is the code that gets executed in the case where there's no error. And here before you, it, it jumps to the command to um, go ahead and parse the, the tag. It calls this f hold function, which is what it moves the pointer back one. And the, the L error case is what happens when there was an error. And in the L error case, it, it prints a, an error message. And then it just goes to the consume attribute and it doesn't call the f hold. So the f hold function was supposed to be called in both branches, but it got forgotten and it didn't get called in the error case. And so the pointer didn't get set back. And so the pointer got um, incremented beyond the end of the pointer and the end, beyond the end of the buffer. And that, that's how it got um, incremented too far. So What's going on here is the code is improperly handling a detected error condition. So it successfully detected that there was an error in the input. There was no right bracket in that in the specific example here, um, but there was a bug in how the validator code handled that case. And likely, well, it seems quite likely that there is a, the, the code here is too complicated. I mean, arguably the Cloudflare um, engineers are correct in saying that there was no bug in the Ragel library. The bug was in the way they were using the Ragel library, but you could say, uh, well, one could argue that the interface was too complicated to, it's, it's too error prone to make the um, users decrement this pointer in both cases, that that's an error prone pattern that would likely cause this kind of mistake. So that's the cloud bleed 
incident. Can, can I ask a quick question just there? Just yeah, to, um, sure, please. Um, it, it's, it seems like an easy pass to the Regal Library to change that equality test into a uh, less than equal test. Is that was that something they contemplated? So I think the um, I, I don't know the 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 Regal people were separate people, so they weren't included in the analysis here. I would think that that would in fact be a good defensive programming um, right. step. So uh, I think that the overall security here would be dramatically improved by making that test be a less than or equal to test instead of just an equal test. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and please do feel free to, to ask questions uh, as we're going. It will be much more fun to be interactive than particularly when I can only really see my slides and, and maybe one person at a time. So please do feel free to, to interrupt. It's more fun to talk to people than to my computer screen. Right, as always, you can ask questions in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to speak, raise your hand and I can let you unmute yourself. Cool. Uh, OK. Okay, so then the next um, uh, parsing related vulnerability that I wanted to talk about is called psychic paper uh, after its uh, finder, discoverer, and after a doctor, it's a Doctor Who reference in some way. I'm not super Doctor Who literate, but um, so this was a zero day that allowed an attacker to escape the iOS sandbox. So the iOS um, sandbox uses P lists to represent entitlements. So entitlements uh, are a refinement to the Usenix permission based system. Um, and when you load an app, an app has associated with it a list of permissions, things that the app is allowed to do. Um, and plist is the uh, representation that iOS uses to represent those entitlements. plist is just a representation that is um, a, a simple form of XML. And I, iOS has actually four, at the time it had four plist parsers, um, and they didn't all agree. They agreed on correct plist data, but they had slightly different interpretations of erroneous plist data. And the problem was that the parser that was queried when the app got loaded saw a different thing than the parser that got queried when the app actually started to act. So when the app got, um, got loaded, the system said, okay, what authorizations is this app asking for? And the parser went and parsed the plist file at that point, and it said, none, it doesn't want any. Um, and so the system said, okay, fine, we can live with that. But then when the parser, when the app started running and started to actually do things, well, then a different parser got called to say, you know, is it okay for the app to do this? And that parser, when it got past the plist file, came up with a different list of things that were, um, it was entitled to do. And that list was much, much more per permissive. In fact, it was basically um, carte blanche to do anything, including escaping from the sandbox, which is the task for PD allow uh, entitlement. So the, the code in the box here is the actual zero day. It's as simple as this. And the key problem is what's highlighted here in yellow. These um, are comment forms in XML and they're, they're not quite accurate. And so the, the various plist parsers were kind of trying to, well, I'm not sure why they did the way they did, but instead of being very hardcore about like, you're not exactly in the right format, we're gonna say no, this is a parsing error and, and, and say no, they um, uh, were permissive and went ahead and the, the the one that ran at the very beginning to say like, um, can you have, what authorizations can you ask and came up with nothing, interpreted as this opening comment matching this closing comment down here. And so all of this piece ended up as a, a comment form and got erased. Whereas the parser that got called later to ask like, can we, you know, what can you go ahead and actually do, interpreted as this, as the these brackets at the top as the extent of the comment. And so all of this in the middle came out as what it actually was allowed to do. And so got basically carte blanche. And this has appeared also in, on Android where the Android master key bugs are similar, um, similar um, where the authorizations of the, there were multiple parsers for the authentication files and the one that got ran at install time said they're not asking for anything. And the one that got ran at run at actual use time said, oh yeah, they can do anything. So it's not just this one, the psychic paper instance. So here the problem is that there's more than one parser for the same data and also permissive processing of erroneous data as opposed to if the data doesn't match exactly what it's supposed to, basically being hardcore and saying, nope, sorry, you have to, uh, you're, you're a bug, we have to fix you. You're, you're not a well-formed file, we're gonna throw you out. Okay, so then the next breach or next bug, parsing related bug is the Equifax breach. 
So in the Equifax breach, we had 147 million people had their personal uh, information exposed. This resulted in a uh, up to $425 million settlement for affected consumers. The attack achieved full remote code execution uh, with the privilege of the web server. So what was the underlying cause here? The Apache Struts Jakarta multi-party parser, it throws an exception on a unexpected content type. So the content type tag is telling the system kind of what kind of content follows. So like normal legal values are things like image JPEG, text plain, video MPEG, audio X-Wave, things like that. But you could, you know, this is data coming from the outside. So the outside could supply whatever they want. Um, so an attacker could supply a um, OGNL expression. So OGNL is the um, object graph navigation library. It's an open source expression language for Java. Basically, you can supply a little program fragment and the system will detect that this is not what is expected and so it will throw an error. So, so far so good, it detected that there was a mistake. The problem is it passes the mistake um, unescaped to a Java a utility, localized util, textutil.find, um, to build an error message. And that function executes the OGNL expression. And the OGNL expression um, can include calls to system, uh, Java system calls, like Java core process builder, which allows external processes to run. So this allowed the attacker to get remote code execution and was what um, led to this exfiltration of information. Um, so here the problems were, you know, they detected successfully the error condition, but they didn't properly handle the error condition, right? The, um, right, the bad things happened after the error condition was detected. And the bad things that happened after the error condition was detected was they processed that input without actually validating it, right? There was no requirement that the argument to content type was sanitized or checked in any way. And that the content coming from the outside was allowed to um, execute system calls and load calls remotely. So it allowed remote code execution kind of in the grammar coming from the outside. So, so Kathleen, maybe uh, just yeah. uh, um, there's a question, and, and it's it's actually on on your previous slide about <laughs> key lists. And yeah, um, um, uh, Benjamin Delaware asks, uh, why does iOS have multiple parsers for key lists? And and That's and, really I, and really I'll add to that. Um, in this case, it seems like uh, you know um, XML parsers, HTML parsers in general, like these kinds of things, are designed for better or worse to be very very tolerant in. Uh, with respect to sort of uh, errors, they try to recover from errors and uh, because they don't want to break the web or whatever. Um, it, it seems like in this case, just having the you know one parser and have it you know do its error correction in whatever way, but do it consistently everywhere would have would have solved the problem, right? Or would have prevented this particular problem. Uh, so so why why are there multiple plus parsers in in iOS? Yeah, so I, I don't know why exactly. Um, I think that I can think of two reasons why there might be. Um, I think one is different parsers are doing slightly different things. Um, and you, you might have different performance requirements or different, like you only care about certain parts of the data and you don't want to spend the time for other parts. Like you could imagine like you have a big file and one parser cares about one part of the file, another parser cares about another part of the file and just wants to get through the other part of it as fast as possible to get to the part that you care about. So you could imagine something like that, which I don't think is the case in the plist parser case. Um, so in, in that situation, I think you you might want to do something like generate the parser from a, a shared specification and then customize it with some kind of partial evaluation or where you you might have multiple parsers, but you guarantee that they're consistent on the parts that they're dealing with. So, so something like that. Um, another reason why you might have multiple parsers has to do with the org chart. <laughs> um, and I think that um, that I think comes down to how important, how, how much of an, is there an awareness of the security ramifications of having multiple parsers and how important is it to not have multiple parsers because of the org chart and um, how much pressure can the organ the higher level organization put on to say like no we can't do that the the, the cost of the security cost of the organization is unacceptable we need to figure out how to restructure this so I, I think there could be both technical and organizational reasons why you might have multiple uh, parsers and we should be working to solve the technical reasons and to solve the organizational reasons right do you know what the patch was for for this this particular <laughs> problem they added two more parsers. <laughs> 
Oh man, okay. It's a con yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully in the long run they get it down to one, but in the short term they they fixed it by adding two more parsers. Jeez. Okay, thanks. So I think I had finished talking about the Equifax breach, and I was going to talk start talking about the Apache Solar uh, issue. So um, Solar is a Java-based open source enterprise search platform. Um, and a vulnerability here allowed remote code execution and exfiltration of sensitive information. In 2018, it became a target for crypto miners as a way of people to break in and steal cycles from computers all over the world, right? The, the graph on the slide shows where people were using this vulnerability to steal cycles from computers. Um, the causes here were an incorrectly configured XML query parser. So one of the features of XML is you can allow, you can specify a new uh, DTT, uh, a document type description, um, and you can specify that the description, that that new, new DTT should be DTD, should be loaded from a remote location. And that that code, the code to define the DTD should be fetched from a remote location and in a way that bypasses checking and firewalls. Um, and the default configuration for the Java version of the XML query parser was unsafe. So lots of instances of the Java XML query parser uh, had this incorrect configuration to allow this flexible feature in XML. So the, the Solar library actually detected that this was a mistake and reported errors, but only after the attacker's execution uh, actions had already been executed. And this, this feature of XML to allow these remote execution, the remote fetching of DTDs um, uh, is a huge security vulnerability. And it's something that JSON doesn't, doesn't have. So it, it explains why in 2017, for example, XML had 850 CVEs versus JSON only having 96, even though you know, XML is also older, but the JSON didn't have this particular feature. So here the, the problems were that the input was processed before validation to, to um, and this, the specification was too, like the fact that you have to turn off this feature um, su suggests that the specification is, is too complex. And although it detected the error condition, it didn't correctly squash the negative consequences of the error, right? So the error wasn't handled properly. And this is a pretty common uh, problem. So this graph is taken from a paper um, uh, that was, um, called SOC, XML parser vulnerabilities. So these authors studied 33 different XML parsers, and they looked at denial of service attacks, which are the first three columns, and then um, this XXE is the XML external entity feature, which is the ability to go and fetch remote um, DTD um, entities, basically, um, that leads to file system access attacks. And then the last category are server-side request forgeries. And the, the red boxes are places where these XML parsers were vulnerable to these attacks. So there were like 165 vulnerabilities across the 33 parsers. So these, these vulnerabilities that were manifest in the Apache Solar uh, attacks are, are widespread, or you know, were, were widespread in 2016 at the time of this attack. And there are many more, right? As I mentioned at the beginning, 80% of the CVE is related to input validation failures from the mentioned in the Safe Docs BAA. In the 2020 CWE Top 25 Most Dangerous Software Weaknesses, the first one is improper neutralization of input during web page generation, which is cross-site scripting. That's an input validation problem. Number three is just improper input validation. So two of the top three problems are, um, are related to input validation. More than a thousand parser bugs have been reported from Mozilla products related to PDF, zip, PNG, and zip files. And then um, a really interesting study of the Open SSL crypto library that studied um, bugs reported from January 2015 to January 2016. They enumerated 47 different vulnerabilities during that period. And what of those 47 vulnerabilities, they reported that 13 of the 47 came from what they call shotgun parsing. Shotgun parsing is where you interleave the parsing and the validation. So instead of like do the validation and then do the parsing. It's like you you parse a little, you validate a little, you parse a little, you validate a little. And the the challenge with this is that it's very easy to forget to do all the validation that you need to do and accidentally end up forgetting to do some of the necessary validation. And 11 of the 47 vulnerabilities came about from processing invalid input, 
like the plist example, although that's a you know, different scenario, um, or failing to reject a known invalid input. So of those of the 47 problems, vulnerabilities, 24 came from parsing. So more than half of the security bugs came from parsing problems. And that's a that's in a you know a crypto library. So basically a big problem. So just collecting all of the um, problems that we've identified in this sort of series of parsing vulnerabilities that we've gone through in this talk so far, there were bugs that were related to software design flaws, things that like you know processing input before validation, improperly handling detected error conditions, having more than one parser for the same data. Um, there were things that were related to grammar design flaws, like having a grammar be too complicated, like the heartbeat case, allowing remote code execution, like the exit, um, like having the OGNL expressions being able to um, uh, call Java systems calls or the XML cases being able to go refetch um, remote DVDs. Um, PD PDF we didn't talk about, but PDF allows you to embed really, you know, Turing complete languages inside. Um, we didn't talk about untagged unions, but that's another problem where you have a union case and you don't know what case, what, what tag of the union is there. We talked about validator implementation errors where there's bugs that are like format errors that are not detected, things like um, often related to length fields, like we saw that with the Heartbleed and the PPB daemon example, and then permissive processing of invalid input, like the psychic paper not detecting that the, um, the plist format was actually incorrect. So I think the conclusion from all of this is that writing parsers is actually dangerous. And just like we've learned that writing crypto is not something that should be done by the uninitiated, um, it should really only be done by experts. Writing parsers should be done by experts and generally should not be done by hand. So I would like to suggest that there is a safer, uh, high assurance path forward um, that looks different. And in this different path, I would say we start by writing a specification in a formal language and that that formal language should be as simple as possible. Um, because simpler specs support more automated tools and stronger and easier, easier reasoning. So we get more support from our reasoning tools. And that the specification should not have access to system resources like the XML or the OGNL bugs that we talked about. Then from that specification, we can generate a high assurance or a preferably a verified parser. And then we can then use the implementation to validate the grammar. So we do need to make sure that the grammar that we're working with is the grammar for the language that we're actually want to work with, that we, we care both what's in the language and what's not in the language. And we need to be precise about that barrier, not just that what's in the language and then we don't really care about what's not in the language. We need to know what's in and what's not in. We need to not waffle. And we need to be strict in our interpretation to not encourage bad behavior like the psychic paper uh, zero day. And many PDF exploits come about because PDF parsers and, and readers are have been historically extremely lenient. And that leniency has given attackers lots of room to, uh, to wiggle through. And then we need to vet client code. So we need to not process input until it's been validated. So avoiding the shotgun parsing um, anti-pattern uh, that was first identified or called that, I think, in the seven turrets of ballot paper that I forgot to mention in the previous slide. We need to make sure we don't have multiple inconsistent parsers. Even if they're independently correct, that can lead to vulnerabilities. Is there a question? Yeah, so uh, Ben Zorn asks, um, well, first he says, it's a wonder XML is still used anymore. Um, but then he says, is preventing um, the extensibility of XML with user supplied DTD parsers part of this approach? Yeah, indeed. So that what I would say is part of the keeping the spec as simple as possible. So you want to make sure that the spec doesn't have that that feature. So I mean, in, in XML, you have to remember to disable that feature. Uh, JSON just doesn't have that feature. So I think you know JSON is more secure as a result because you don't have to remember to turn it off. But if you, you know, so either you have a spec that doesn't have it, which is sort of preferable, or if you have a spec that has it, then you need to make sure that in your checklist or your, your toolkit, you make sure that that spec is, that feature is disabled. Yeah, and ironically, XML was developed as a simplification of SGML, right? Well, we're, we're converging on better security. Uh, ben adds, is there, oh, is there a case to be made for it? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it, like if you're working in your own system and you're not exposed to the outside world, it's nice to have that flexibility where you can add more, more, um, you can add a new document type by defining a new DTD and, and being able to get it. I guess the part where it becomes um, questionable is the ability to go fetch it over the web in some, you know, like that opens up the 
um, the risk of now you can you're exposed to whoever else in the in the wide world could be part of that conversation. So you know it's it's not a bad feature to to want to have. It's just that is it worth the um, the security risk that it brings into uh, that it that it comes with it. And I, I I think given the large number of security vulnerabilities that's come with it, I think the argument is like no, it's not worth it. Um, but I, I suspect that there are others who could make a different case. Okay, so formal specification language. So I'm, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about each of these four boxes. So the first box is uh, writing the formal specification of desired language. So there's a whole range of formal specification languages, starting with like regular expressions at the top, uh, going down to context sensitive grammars. So in general, at the top, you have languages that are um, easier to process where the there are more tools that more decidability properties, for example, more things that can be done fully automatically and the algorithms for processing the languages uh, are faster and more efficient. Whereas at the bottom, the uh, algorithms are uh, have higher complexity and the code is more complex. So, in, in, you know, if it's verified, maybe it doesn't matter. But if it's not verified, it's easier to trust in general the, the implementations higher up and the performance is generally faster for the implementations higher up. Of course, you have to have a good implementation. Um, so, like, for example, almost any interesting property about regular expressions is decidable, while as any interesting property about context free grammars is generally undecidable. Um, oops. Didn't mean to click there. Um, so, uh, right, and right, so regular expressions at the top, and then we have context free grammars where you have ranges of different kinds of restrictions. So, visibly pushed down automata are a class of context free uh, grammar that a uh, subset of them designed to be where to make the kind of bracketing structure. The uh, one of the content, one of the defining characteristics of context free grammars is is parentheses, right? You, you can match left and right parentheses. That's one of the things that distinguishes context free grammars from regular expressions and visibly push down automata and make that structure you know, painfully abundantly clear. And in exchange, they get a lot of decidability properties, uh, which makes them pleasant to reason about. Um, then we have LL, LL grammars, which admit top-down parsing, but don't support left recursion or grammars that don't happen to fit in the kind of token look-ahead um, requirements of LL grammars. We have deterministic context-free grammars, things like SLR and LR parsers. These support decidable equivalence testing, which would allow us to test, are these two parsers equivalent, which would help with the psychic parser problem. Um, and then we have grammars like all-star, which is the algorithm, or, um, which is the approach that underlies the antler parser generator that are open to everything except things that have left recursion. And then there are context-free grammars that are um, the full class of things supported by context-free grammars, I guess. Um, and then we have the context-sensitive grammars. And here, this is an interesting place because a lot of the, the packet formats are ones that um, uh, require context sensitivity. So in Heartbleed, for example, where we saw the length field and then the, the buffer of that length, that's an example of something that requires context sensitivity to express. So you can't express that kind of a property in a context-free grammar. Um, so it, it those kinds of formats are kind of at the bottom of this hierarchy, even though those kinds of formats don't actually require a lot of the um, the power of the infrastructure for context-free grammars in general, the, the non-determinism that allows you to um, tell which kind of a branch you're in for a, a choice or the length of a, of a sequence, the, the star and the alternation patterns are not really important for Heartbleed kind of format. So the, the very bottom, they're using more powerful than context-free grammar features to, to get the kind of dependency features, but they don't need all of the power of other parts of context-free grammar. So they're kind of in a, a weird place here. I mean, they're, they're more powerful than context-free grammars. They can do things like A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, which is the canonical example of something that you can't do in a context-free grammar. But in other ways, they don't need the full power of the context-free grammar. So they're kind of an exception to um, uh, declining performance, increasing expressiveness. In a way, they have more expressiveness, but in a way, they have less expressiveness. And they generally are really fast because they are, they are um, required to be parsed really, really fast um, without any kind of backtracking. 
Um, and then Ben asked, does equivalence testing include how errors are handled? Yeah, my sense is not. I think that's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, in general, errors are the kind of poor stepchildren. They're not treated very, they're kind of like the afterthought. Like, um, And I think that errors deserve a lot more attention because errors are where attackers usually break into a system. And so doing a lot more careful thought about how errors are handled would be really useful. Kind of developing a theory of security for parsers would be more explicit about error handling. So one of the positive things about these expressive languages is that many of these specification languages now have verified parsers that go with them. So regular expressions, there are a bunch of different work on verified um, parsers for regular expressions. For We have verified implementations of LL1 parsers, SLR, LR1, context-free grammars, parsing expression grammars, and these um, parsers for um, these kind of data dependency languages. And I will talk more about these um, in the next few slides. Okay, so high assurance, so that, that's about specification languages. And now I'm gonna talk about how do we get high assurance parsers. So I wanna start not by talking about verified parsers, but by talking about testing for parsers because um, verified parsing is a, is a big investment and testing is uh, a, a way you can get started even if you don't want to talk about your improving infrastructure. So Bohemia is a nice differential testing tool for parser generators that is going to be appearing at Langsec next week, like a, eight days from today. This is um, a paper that is um, Gang Tang and his student are the authors of. So the idea is to use equivalence modulo inputs, and they they this is the chart from their figure the figure from their paper where they use the figure from the Orion paper, which was talking about. Um, equivalence modulo inputs for a compiler. But the basic idea is you take um, the, the parser that you want to test, or the Orion in this case, um, and you uh, feed in the input that you want to test and you um, and, and a variant. So you have the, the, the grammar that you want to test and a variant of the grammar, and you opt, you, um, you, you modify the, the grammar. So you end up with a, the, the original grammar and a new version of the grammar that is semantically equivalent. And now you pass those two semantically equivalent grammars through the parser and you check to see if the two outputs are the same. And they should be the same because the way you modified the grammar was to make sure, uh, was to preserve semantic equivalence. So if they're not the same, then you've detected a bug. So the, uh, yeah. so the idea behind Bohemia is to take the grammar and to come up with ways of perturbing the grammar so that it preserves the overall semantics. And the, the idea is they have the grammar and they generate a string that's in the grammar, and then they look to see how that string is in the grammar, what part, what rules in the grammar are used and what rules are not. And then they prune dead productions, ones that might be relevant for other parts, but not particular for that, that particular string. And then they add new productions. So the derivation of the string is unaffected, but the grammar is different. Um, that's the pruning and productions and adding new productions cases. And then they, also roll and unroll production. So they, they don't change the semantics of the grammar, but they change the structure of the grammar. And then they, they do this many, many times so that they get lots and lots of examples. Uh, and they use this to test five different parser infrastructures. So Lark is a parsing library for Python that supports three different parsing algorithms. Nearly is an implementation of early for JavaScript. Derp, Derpy is a derivative style parsing library for Python. Happy is an LALR parser generator that's in Haskell and early.db is a Ruby implementation of the early parsing algorithm. And by doing this kind of um, equivalence modulo input testing, they found uh, different kinds of bugs. They found mismatched output where the two different implement, two different parsers, well, the parsers with two different grammars, equivalent grammars gave out different input, sorry, gave different output. Um, they ran out of memory or they gave infinite loops. So in these five different mature parsing libraries found that they found bugs in, in all of them. Um, it, the limitation, it doesn't handle LL or PEG parsing libraries, so it's, it's specific to certain kinds of algorithms. But I think this is a promising approach to um, produce higher assurance um, versions of grammar, of, of parsing libraries with relatively low overhead, right? It's pretty cheap to go ahead and do this, and you could do this at scale. Um, 
relatively easily. And you could extend this to other kinds of parsing infrastructures. I do think it would be really interesting to extend this to error cases because you want to have parsers to be equivalent, not just on the languages, the strings that are in the language, but the strings that are not in the language as well. Okay, so, um, but if we're ready to bite the bullet and we want to actually have a verified implementation and we have our language is sufficiently simple that we want to be able to use a regular expression uh, specification instead of a more powerful grammar, then we could use verbatim. So verbatim is a verified regex matcher that is also being published next week at Langsec. This is work that uh, my PhD student and my undergrad, this is an undergrad thesis um, at, at Tufts. So this is based on, Brzow I never can say this word properly, um, Brzezowski, um, uh, derivatives. So the idea of the derivative style approach, which is a very popular uh, approach to uh, verifying both regular expression libraries and compilers is uh, the notion of a derivative. So here in the, the top corner, you can see the idea of a derivative. So this is a set of strings and we take the derivative with respect to C, we basically just chop off the first C character of all the strings that have C. So the string C becomes the empty string, which is represented by Lambda. The string cat becomes at, catch becomes atch, cow becomes ow, and the two strings that don't have a C just get dropped out of the set. And similarly, then we can take the derivative with respect to A and the derivative with respect to T, and we can tell that the string cat is in this original set because the empty string is in the, the last uh, set. So in general, a string Z is in the language if and only if the empty string is in the derivative of the language with respect to that string. And this is being done with respect to um, the, the set of strings, but you can also do the same kind of derivative calculation with the representation of the string as a, a representation of the language as a regular expression. Um, so the paper formalizes this notion of derivative-based regular expression matching and implements the maximal munch principle. So if you have a bunch of different regular expressions to lex a file, it prefers the, um, the longest match uh, in the uh, first, um, the longest match first, basically. Um, Derek, my student, proved soundness, completeness, uniqueness, and termination. He implemented it in Cock and extracted it to OCaml. Um, the implement, and they measure the performance. Um, sadly, the performance is quadratic. We know that linear is, pro uh, is possible for the maximal munch principle um, if you use memoization. So Derek is currently verifying optimizations so that the chart, the graph here, shows the performance. So the horizontal axis is the number of characters being lexed and the vertical axis is the processing time. Um, the green line is the original implementation with the derivatives. The blue line is an implementation that he's worked on to convert it into DFAs and he's in the process of verifying this. And then the pink line is converting, is using the memoization to get it. Um, it's still not, it looks linear, but it's not quite linear yet. Um, the problem is that the, um, Cox Core Library doesn't yet support constant time lookup, so it's still a little bit nonlinear. There are various other um, regular expression matchers, most of which are also based on derivatives. Um, the, then the open challenges here are, we wanna get the performance down, we wanna make it easier to use. Um, also, all of these tools, so that the rock solid implementation is embedded in a tool that's doing um, software fault isolation, so it's not actually a standalone tool. And the others are all set up to be um, uh, lexers for a parser downstream. But using a standalone tool for manipulating regular expressions is actually a useful thing that lots of people want to do separately. So I think it would be really useful to just create a standalone regular expression library that would be fast and verified. So that's something that I think the community should be doing. Okay, so that's verbatim. Then CoStar. CoStar is a verified version of Antler 4. So this is going to be appearing at PLDI um, this year. This is joint work with Sam Lasser, who is my PhD student. In fact, this is Sam's part of Sam's thesis work. Um, so CoStar implements a functional version of AllStar, the parsing algorithm underlying Antler 4. It accepts any non-left recursive co context-free grammar. It's implemented in Cock and is extracted to OCaml. Uh, Sam proves soundness, completeness, and termination. Proving termination was by far the hardest part of the whole process. Um, the part of the system is it correctly detects if the input is ambiguous. And the termination proof does not rely on a fuel argument. It um, calculates 
uh, that the system is making progress based on consuming input, um, making progress on the stack of the, that's used in the context-free grammar and the number of non-terminals that have been processed. We measure the performance and like Antler, it's linear in practice, but there is a significant slowdown, which is what's shown here. It's like the graphs in the top right show that the system is linear in practice. We fit a lowest curve, which is unconstrained to the data points and the, the lowest curve comes out as linear. Um, and then the bottom right hand, right hand shows that the overhead of parsing um, using the extracted OCaml parser compared to raw antler is between 5.9 in the best case and 52.2 in the worst case. Although this, when we compare the, the lexer plus the parser, it's between 4.4 and 9.9. .9, so we still have room for improvement. And there are a number of other context-free parser, context-free grammar parsers that have been verified. Um, some of them are restricted to LL1 parsers. Some of them don't prove termination except through a fuel argument. And some of them are designed for general purpose context-free grammars. So designed to handle a full range of amb ambiguity. So have a different point in the performance um, trade-off space. Okay, so then the next point I wanna talk about is Everparse, which is a, um, a, a different um, point in the spectrum. So Everparse is about parsing the packet formats, things like Heartbleed and the PPN packet format. So here, um, the domain, yeah, is authenticated message formats. So the Prager writes a high level specification in a C-like data description DSL. So the, um, the table on the top right hand uh, side shows kind of what a program input format looks like here. So the message here would be a pair of a size, which is a UN32 and it's constrained when the, the light blue are, are format constraints says that the size has to be less than 1024. And then the, the second part of the pair is the messages, which um, is an array, a fixed size array, where the size of the array is the size that just came. Um, and then each message is a tag followed by the message. And the message is one of these message unions and it takes as an argument, the tag that tells it what the, what the actual payload body is actually. Is actually. So, um, uh, the format language is a lot like the PADS data description language, which I worked on for a long time. Um, so the tool chain here is that the, um, the, the programmer writes in this high level specification and then the untrusted quacky ducky compiler translates this into a F star um, parser combinator library that uses a um, monadic structure. It's called low parse. And the low parse monadic uh, parser combinator library has a bunch of different kinds of combinators. The highest level combinators are kind of the specification library combinators and the Everparse team used those combinators to prove the security properties um, that they, um, the parsers that would be generated from the system are, the parsers are gonna be safe and, um, and secure so that anyone, they, they prove an additional property that's necessary for um, uh, authentication in crypto, which is that the high level representation and the wire representation are in one-to-one -one correspondence so that you don't end up with extra on disk representations that a crypto hacker could use to fake out the, the crypto and, and hack, the, hack the crypto. Um, then they have the F star implementation um, combinators, which they can use to prove that the, um, the parsing is correct. And they have a really a lower level implementation that they pr prove memory safety for. And from those combinators, they can extract to F sharp they can also use the Kremlin compiler to extract down to memory safe zero copy C code. So fast code that is uh, uh, just as fast as handwritten versions, um, which is super nice. Um, and then they can use, they don't prove that the quacky ducky compiler is correct, but you can do interoperability testing to prove that the high level specification matches the implementation of the, the low level specification. And they've been able to use this language to express like Bitcoin block format, every format in TLS 1.0 to 1.3, quick record form uh, layout, dice measured boot protocol, and all, you know, about 100 proto uh, formats from Hyper-V virtual switch. They just published on their blog last week uh, a bunch of these results. It's super uh, impressive results. Uh, I think this is like the best example of high assurance parser that's ready for prime time. Um, it's available for GitHub open source. And I think like it should be uh, trying to get like as many people to use this kind of tool chain as, as possible. 
there are um, other examples of verified parsers for this kind of packet format. So TRX and Parsley are examples of PEG parsers um, that have been verified to be functionally correct. And then Narcissus uh, is a version embedded in uh, Coq that uses um, also a combinator style um, parsing library that uses Cox um, uh, tactic libraries to generate a parser and a um, serializer that are guaranteed to be inverses of each other. But Narcissus and then protocol buff compiler is work that's built on top of Narcissus that, um, so, so Narcissus is intended to be used interactively. So it may be able to generate the parser and the serializer completely automatically, but it may not be. It may, you may have to interact with the Cox tactic library. Protocol buffer compiler is built on top of that is intended to be fully automatic. Um, it doesn't have the malleability property that the on disk and the in memory representation are in one to one correspondence because it's not intended to be used for only for authentication. It's, it's intended to be a you know, slightly different target uh, audience. But all of this is really uh, impressive work in this direction. Uh, Thanks for the great shout out, Kathleen. I appreciate yeah, it. this is super impressive work. I really, really like this work. Um, then I want to talk briefly about the state of the PDF parsing. So PDF parsing is a is a nightmare. The um, PDF is obviously a widely used standard, but flaws allow information extraction and remote code execution. It's a really complex, context sensitive format. Um, the the general structure um, it's a text based format that in, can include um, white space and comments. It's made of a series of objects. Basic objects are null, boolean, integers, real, strings, names, arrays, and dictionaries. Dictionaries are associative tables made of key value pairs that can be exposed in double angle brackets. There are references. References refer to objects by their object number and their generation number. A stream is a combination of a dictionary with has metadata uh, and a byte stream. The simplest overall structure for PDF document has a header up here, and then it has a body that contains the list of all the objects. And then there's a cross-reference table that has the, the number of uh, objects in the, in the file and the locations of all of those objects. And it gives like the, ob the uh, uh, offset of the object, its generation number, and then N if it's being used and F if it's free. So it's like a kind of garbage sitting in the file. And then there's the trailer and the trailer gives the number of um, cross-reference entries. It gives the root object. So like where the top object is and then the start of the cross-reference table. But so that objects, these, these uh, files can be edited quickly, you can add more object cross-reference table trailer sections at the end. So a document can have a whole bunch of these sequences and like you have to kind of chain them together to figure out the overall structure. So the PDF file is not at all context free because of all of these cross reference links and you have to start parsing at the bottom of the document. Um, so the, the uh, Parsec project, which is part of the um, uh, SafeDocs DARPA project is working to create a high assurance parser for PDF documents as are a number of other teams, but the Parsec team has a paper about their effort that's appearing next week at Langsec. They're talking about a, a two-stage architecture where in the first stage, they parse just the syntax using a peg parser that's written in ACL2. And then in the second stage, they validate semantic properties. These kinds of semantic properties are things like some fields are required, like an outline item must have a parent field. Referenced objects have to be a specific type, like the previous field of an outline item must be another outline item. Some values have constraints, like counts have to be positive, and there are no unwanted cycles in reference chains, things like that. Um, so then the, those kinds of properties were collected. There's like a 700 page standard document that was written by hand, it's informal. And the SafeDocs project has converted that into a machine readable um, version of the document. And the Parsec team has taken that DOM model and converted it into ACL2 code. And so the, the tool chain here is they take the peg parser that, that parses the structure, but not the semantic properties. And then they pass that to the format validator, which comes from these derived from the DOM model. And they have that verified parser that then serves as a reference implementation for a performant uh, operational parser that comes that is in C. And this is work in progress, so it's not actually done yet. Um, but that's the, the most advanced current verifying parser format for a PDF. But I think this will change uh, 
because the, there's a whole DARPA program that is working on this, this task. Okay, so let me finish the slides and then I will start to take your questions because I'm running out of time for the um, presentation, but then we will have plenty of time for questions. Okay, yeah, so that's kind of the- You shouldn't sorry. feel constrained by the, the one hour uh, uh, time marker. We've had many questions in, in between, so, uh, so do- Okay, uh, okay so I can take the questions now. How much of the design of PDF was historical and unnecessarily complex versus there are features that provides that require the complexity? That's a really good question. I don't know that I know enough um, to really answer the question, I think that, um, I mean, there's a lot of market pressures towards flexibility and towards um, being all things to all people and not rejecting things, right? So I think that being super permissive is a consequence of not wanting to, I mean, it's probably similar to browsers, right? Where browsers want to accept, like show every web page as much as possible. They don't want to give an error that says like, no, we can't display this page. Um, uh, I, mean, I think this re relates to the, the issue of misaligned incentives, that we don't have enough, um, like the economics of bad security are not aligned properly. And if we had, like, if the people who, like if, if the costs of security were allocated to the people who were designing PDF, the PDF would be designed differently. <laughs> And I, I think the problem is that the cost of security are borne by completely different people and in a very diffuse kind of way. It's kind of a tragedy of the commons kind of a thing. And if the costs were allocated in a different way, we would get a different design. Is there an equivalent of JavaScript, the good parts for Java? That's what SafeDocs is working on, is trying to come up with a, a core, sensible, sanitized part of PDF and then trying to work on adapters to translate the Wild West part of PDF into a core sanitized part and then be able to like translate the wild part into the core part and, and move over time into a more sanitized, cleaner version that will cut down on the, the wild west scary parts of, of PDF. I mean, they're like, they're good reasons why you wanna be able to like add parts at the end. You don't wanna have to, like if you have a huge PDF document, you don't wanna make it take five minutes to make an edit, right? So um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so that was the end of the towards verified PDF parsing. Now I want to talk a little bit about the problem of validating grammars. Like, how do you know that the grammar that you have that we've just like written a specification language in uh, is the right grammar? So validating grammar is not a verification problem. It's a validation problem. It requires systemic testing, not verification. You can't prove that the grammar is right. It's just you have to think about whether the grammar is right. Um, so there's, as far as I can tell, there's actually a lot less work on the problem of validating grammars than verifying grammars. For one, like, so what, where might we get started? So you have to actually, like a grammar is just a set of symbols. So if we want to be able to manipulate it, we need to convert it into a parser or a printer to be able to play with it. Um, and once we do that, we can start to test it. So we can test that, the right strings are in the language by testing that if we uh, print something and then parse it, we get back the same thing that we started from. So that's kind of like, you know, do we do we have the, is our language expressive enough? And we can check that the parser isn't too permissive, that there aren't too many things in the language, um, and that's checking the next property, but that that's much less easy to test um, automatically, that there aren't strings in the language that shouldn't be in the language. Um, there are a very uh, range of approaches we could take. So we could, um, to kind of vet the grammar. So we could confirm desired properties. We could check to make sure that a grammar is in a given grammar class. It's not left recursive. It's not ambigu ambiguous. It's not malleable, for example. Um, we could perform differential testing. Like the, the Petra paper that was published in Popple 2021 did this. So Petra is a formalization of the P4 uh, data plane language for software defined networking. And there, there was an existing uh, implementation of the language and they wanted to formalize it. So they wrote down a grammar and then they sort of, they compared the existing interpreter to their formalization and found places where they differed. So it's kind of like the um, equivalence modulo inputs, the, the testing in Bohemia, like find places where the two different witnesses differ is a way of, of, of banging on it. Then another place, uh, another opportunity, another piece of related work is in testing grammars that are written for human language 
there's this paper automatic test suite generation for PM CFG grammars where the authors um, systematically explored a natural language grammar by coming up with example sentences and giving them to an expert. Like, did you mean this? Did you mean this? Did you mean that? Um, as, a, as a way, so we could do a similar thing for computer languages. And then a, a very different approach would be to watch for shifts over time. So the PADS data description language didn't expect data to conform to the grammar. And when it parsed data, it would return both a, a parse, but also then metadata that said, like, did it match or did it not match? And you could build up over time a, a, a library of what matched and what didn't. And you could watch for drift and you could you could tell like over time, like the grammar, the, the data is matching or not matching. And you could decide you wanted to shift the grammar. Um, so I think maybe there's not a huge amount of work on validating grammars because grammars have been historically written by people. And the assumption is the person wrote the grammar correctly. Why do you need more assessment? But one possibility in the future is that grammars will be learned by looking at lots of examples or by, by looking at code and inferring what the grammar must have been from that code or by taking natural language documents and inferring the grammar. And now you have a machine that wrote the grammar. And so I think testing will become more important when grammars are coming from those kinds of sources. OK, so then vetting the client code, the last, the last box. Some of this is just best practice, like check checklist for like is how many parsers do we have? Like, do we have one parser? Do we have more than one parser? If there are multiple parsers, if they're unavoidable, can we check that they are equivalent? And this would be a place where we would be at an advantage if the grammar was simpler and we could do that automatically. Can we ensure that the client code responds appropriately to all error conditions that the parser can signal? Uh, and this might be a case where we could create a new kind of language construct or we could derive from the grammar a template to make sure that the code actually does respond to all the possible error conditions. And this is a place where the security mindset is really important, right? Because if you if your mindset is that the world is benign, then errors don't happen very often. They don't matter very much. But if your work mindset is that the world is being driven by malicious attackers who are going to drive your system into every error condition that they can possibly make, then it's really important that you deal with all the error conditions. And so being methodical about making sure no matter what an attacker can throw at me, we're going to handle it properly it is worthwhile. And so, you know, outward facing things, it's, it's worthwhile to structure the code in a way that you can, you know, just point to it like, yes, absolutely. Look, here's all the possible error conditions. We are handling all those error conditions. We are not doing anything with code um, until it's been processed for these cases. Um, we want to structure, the, and then similarly, we want to structure the client code to avoid the shotgun parsing. You want to validate everything um, and then process it. I, I did uh, see a comment in the Everparse infrastructure that said that you could you could interleave it in a way that you still guaranteed safety. I, I didn't see enough to be able to understand what that meant. I would love to, to hear more about that when I finish the, the talk. Um, and then of course we should just use standard security testing, gray box fuzzing a la AFL and white box testing a la SAGE to make sure that the, the system is using the grammar properly. And of course, one of the challenges with using um, uh, fuzzing is that when you have structured input, like you have when you're having a grammar, Fuzzing doesn't always work very well because fuzzing isn't aware of the structure of the, the inputs. Of course, fuzzing cares, like we heard in the last DS3 meeting two weeks ago, fuzzing wants to go blazingly fast. But the, the Superior paper, which is the last thing that I wanted to talk about, um, it does, makes a really nice um, extension to AFL, American Fuzzy Lop, to take advantage of the structure that the information that it knows about for um, from the grammar. So the idea is that it's a like AFL, it's a coverage based gray box fuzzer that um, uses knowledge about the grammar to be more smart about how it does the fuzzing. So, you know, AFL just trims and mutates at the bit and byte level. And so AFL struggles to maintain well formedness for inputs, for structured inputs, things like grammars. And so what Superior does is it extends AFL with grammar based strategies. So when it does trimming, it doesn't just eliminate random bytes, it also eliminates subterms. So it, it, it parses the input according to the grammar that it knows about, and then it will eliminate entire subterms. And for mutations, it will insert and replace tokens from a dictionary where these tokens are grammatic are, are tokens from the grammar. And it will replace entire subtrees from the grammar with subtrees from another document or another you know, parsed version of the data. So of the yeah, of the format. So um, it's all kind of grammar aware. And what is 
Um, but otherwise, it uses the same architecture of AFL. And if when it makes these changes, it makes a change that is not um, still parsed correctly, it falls back onto AFL. So this is just a strict extension of what AFL does. And it, it is it, it does go slower. It's able to come up with fewer examples than AFL, but it is able to find bugs that AFL can't find. So they tested Superior on four different um, uh, programs that use XML and JavaScript, so things that have structured input. So libplist, which is a small portable library, C library for Apple plist formats, um, and then three open source JavaScript engines. So Web, uh, WebKit, JerryScript, and Chakra Core. So WebKit is a cross-platform web browser that powers Safari, iBooks, and App Store. JerryScript is a lightweight JavaScript engine for Internet of Things that runs on constrained small devices. And Chakra Core is a core part of a JavaScript engine that powers Microsoft Edge. And the results are that for libplist, they found 11 bugs, 10 of which were CVEs, and AFL was only able to find five. WebKit found 13 bugs, three of which were CFLs, and neither AFL nor a JavaScript fuzzer, JS fun fuzz, found any. JerryScript that found four bugs, three of which were CF CVEs, and AFL found one. Chakra Core found three bugs, neither AFL nor GS fun fuzz found any. And they got $3.2,000 in bug bounties as a result. Um, so it only considers inputs that parse correctly, and for ones that don't, they refer back to AFL and discard. Um, many parser vulnerabilities actually come about cases where there are subtle mistakes in the grammar. So it might be interesting if you could like somehow run through the grammar cases, but like make small tweaks, but maybe that just falls back to AFL as it is in a standard form. So I, I'm not, not sure about that, but, but Superior is really cool work. Okay, so looking forward. So takeaways, we've made a lot of progress, but we have more to do. Uh, it's really important that we change the mindset that people just widely accept that parsing is dangerous and needs to be done really carefully, and we need to take errors more seriously. High assurance tools are improving significantly. If we can get easy to use high performance, high assurance parsing tools, we'll dramatically improve security. We have a lot more work to do. PDF is obviously a big challenge. SafeDocs is making a lot of progress. For regex and CFG grammars, we need to improve performance. Um, we really should produce a easy to use, high assurance, high performance C-based regex library. I think if we could do that and get that out there, like the way you guys have gotten or that Microsoft has gotten Everparse out there, that could make a really big difference. Um, you know, different clients have different needs with respect to space, times, or portion of interest. Um, if we could generate different parsers from a, a grammar and a description of how it's going to be used, maybe that can cut down on the number of different parsers in use. Um, yeah, and I will just leave the rest and I will take questions. Thanks, Kathleen. That was that's great, really inspiring. Uh, uh, we, we have um, uh, still plenty of time for questions. Um, and uh, I have several, but uh, Ben has one. Let's start with Ben. Why don't you ask a question? Ask, uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. If you, oh, I'll have to make allow you to unmute yourself. Give me a second. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, great. All right. Hey, thank you, Kathleen. Thanks for a great talk. It's actually really interesting to think about um, the challenges and also how. Some of these, some of the things, I, the last comment I made it, it made me really think. Some of these things you're dealing with in terms of parsing, uh, it, you know, data that comes in is a lot like machine learning models, right? They get a piece of data, they make a judgment, you know, uh, the parsing makes a judgment. And the data drift problem that you mentioned with pads is, you know, is exactly the same problem you have with machine learning, where, you know, it, it's it's not a, a fixed thing. It's organic over time. And I, I think you'd see the same thing probably with, uh, um, with uh, PDF, I, you know, the, the PDF probably evolved in terms of how it was being used and, and what how it was defined. Um, so anyway, so I, I, it's a really interesting talk. I think it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, has has broad implications across a number of domains here. Yes, I, I think, you know, uh, building on that on that on that remark, I think discovering specifications is, is uh, and uh, is, is a big problem, especially if, it, you know, um, uh, there's code out there that's doing ad hoc parsing. There's no grammar anywhere. The, what the code accepts today is somehow de facto truth. Figuring out what that is uh, and doing it systematically, even over time, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah, there's work. Um, Alex Aiken has a paper that was in PLDI two years ago, three years ago, that was working on that. Um, uh, 
Andre Zoller has a paper on doing that too. I was going to talk about that, but then I decided I didn't have time. But uh, so those are approaches that take code and use the code as a black box or as a as a gray box to help with inferring the the grammar and and, and that's with the goal of then using it to fuzz the impl uh, the implementation. But it, you could use it to then come up with a parser for the data format as well. Um, there's lots of work on trying to learn regular expressions just from examples. There's a theoretical result that says you can't do it from only positive examples, but just because you can't do it in the abstract doesn't mean you can't actually do it in general cases often without having negative examples, or you could get negative examples. Um, I have a student who's working on the problem for binary data formats, and it's actually encouraging how often you can do it from just raw, raw binary, because in, in general, the formats aren't designed to be um, adversarial, they're designed to be parsed easily, right? I mean, sometimes the designers goof and they make it hard, but the intent was to make it easy, right? Um, and then there's another piece of work that uh, people at SRI did on um, a system called Arsenal, which was reading natural language documents that were describing data formats, and from those natural language documents coming up with data descriptions. So the, those documents are written in a stylized format. So um, they're again, not the full, like it's not written to be hard. I mean, it still is a very hard problem, of course, but it's written in a way that's intended to be easy to read. Um, so I, I think that there's promise for all of those approaches to not maybe solve 100% of the problem, but to go part of the way. Madhan has a question. Madhan, you want to ask the question? Can you unmute yourself? Allow Mike. You should be able to unmute yourself now, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Kathleen. Um, great talk. Um, so something that struck a chord when you said about misalignment of economic economic incentives, you know, it's a huge problem um, in our industry, right? You know, features sell, performance sells, right? But correctness does not, right? Because you pay for the cost of the bugs much later, like whenever there's a security attack or even like simple bugs, like, you know, the users find it, you have to fix it. And, you know, it's actually, it's it's a future cost, right? So how do we deal with that as an yeah. industry? Right, uh, yeah. So I don't know that, um, the, the problem is that, it's a market failure, right? It's not a failure of Google or a failure of Microsoft or a failure of, right. it, it's, a, it's a whole market failure. And I, the way that, um, that's what uh, regulation is for and what, you know, econo like that's what economic studies, right? Is, is how do you structure the market so that the incentives are properly aligned? So I don't think it's something that any, you know, individual company can solve. I think it's something that has to be addressed with policy. Um, and, and this is a scary thing, right? Because nobody likes to be told what to do, but I think it's something that requires industry-wide cooperation and industry can't cooperate. Like that's, that, that's against the rules, right? Unless they are, there are rules that are put in place. So I think it would behoove technical people to think, to partner with political people and come up with a system of, of policy that made sense to get the incentives aligned better so that we could make better technical decisions to solve these problems. I mean, I think we're gonna have to, right? Because I think that um, things like the Colonial Pipeline incident that just happened show what's, what's going to happen if this doesn't change, right? The national security is going to be more and more at risk. Like the future of conflict, the future of warfare isn't going to look like aircraft carriers, even though we're seeing what's happening in Israel right now. It's going to look like nation states who can take down your power grid for indefinite periods of time if you don't do what they want, right? And if, if we're vulnerable to that kind of attack, anytime our adversary wants, we're going to lose, right? We're more technically dependent than many of our adversaries. So we're in a weak position as long as that happens. So we're going, we're, we're being driven, we're, we're moving into a position where we're in a position of weakness unless we can fix this. And so uh, sooner or later, the, the regulation will come. And it would be good if it comes sooner and it comes in a controlled way where the technical and the policy people work together and come up with something that's rational that actually solves the technical problem in a, in a good way and doesn't 
is not overly restrictive on the technical innovation. But if we don't get there, we will have draconian restrictions that come down when really awful things happen. It makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the the uh, that that resonates strongly with me too. Um, I, I think some of the, the the performance constraints and the incentives around you know getting things to go uh, to fast, uh, getting things to go fast, you know, do not don't always align with with security. But I think they can be made to align. Um, so um, uh, so for instance, on this, uh, you know, you were you were wondering about this shotgun parsing in in Everparse and you know why why we have to do it and so on. I mean, it's it's because a a constraint in in applying this to to Hyper V was that no matter what we do, we can't imp we have to fit within a performance overhead of two percent cycles per byte. So adding input validation up front is just a non-starter. So you know it would be the nice thing. It would be a great thing to do to validate everything before you do any processing, but it's just not compatible with the performance profile. Um, but if you take that as a, as a constraint and and then you look at saying, OK, you know, um, we can produce really high performance verified C code to do this. You can do you can generate parsers systematically that are that are that are uh, more performant than the than the handwritten shotgun parsing that you do now. So we actually not only fit within the 2% cycles per byte, we improve performance a little bit. Uh, cool. So. Um, uh, so I, I think you know, uh, in a way, uh, uh, th there's you, you have to somehow evolve what we have now towards where we want it to be, ideally, and that um, that may involve you know um, sort of making some sort of design trade-offs. But but if if you take them as sort of hard constraints, there there's um, there are there are novel solutions that 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 actually you know lead to benefits. Yeah, I think it, it's important to like there are places where the performance really matters and there are places where the people are being lazy <laughs> and I, yeah. I think it's important to know which one you're like. <laughs> yeah. Or, or actually, not being aware of how dangerous it is to do it that way. Like if, if it's like, OK, this is really dangerous, but it's really important and here's how we're going to do it. So even though it's dangerous, we're going to do it right. Like, you know, having a fully verified implementation, like, OK, it's not dangerous anymore. We've proven that all of these kinds of things that might possibly go wrong didn't go wrong. So it's when you get the benefit of the performance and you don't have like you, you took the danger off the table. That's perfectly reasonable. But yeah. doing the shotgun parsing and not even knowing that it's dangerous is is a problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think many of these these low level data formats, even though they are like you mentioned, you know, context sensitive, they're designed to be extremely efficiently parsable. Like exactly. you know, sometimes you can just, you know, often, you know, you can just cast the buffer to the type you want and start reading from it. It's meant to be kind of ABI compatible and so on, which is. Uh, um, uh, ben, another question? This, this conversation uh, just made me think that there are sort of um, just like with the go to consider it harmful. It seems to me that these very complex formats that are hard to parse and hard to you know get correct, et cetera, uh, become problematic like XML, PDF. I mean, is is there um, you know guidance about not doing that? You know, just don't do it, right? <laughs> it seems to me that that's a starting point to get to a, a system where you can do formal verification, you can have a much more confident uh, understanding of you know um, what's possible, right? Well, certainly on the PDF side, the uh, the people who are involved in the PDF standard are actively involved with safe docs. They're working on simplifying things. So I think at this point, there's a, a lot of awareness on how I mean they're 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 stuck with backward compatibility issues, but <laughs> they're I think at this point there's a lot of awareness. And I think also like JSON doesn't have that feature, right? That that uh, got XML into so much trouble. So I think maybe we are learning slowly about these problems. And we did get rid of Flash, right? Flash was another disaster <laughs> format. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the the browser vendors have a lot of power, right? Like, like mm. no, we're not going to have that format anymore. Um, so I, I think we are slowly moving towards more security. Um, I am a little worried about a rude awakening coming at some point because of the national security issues. I don't know exactly how steep a cliff that will be. Can you imagine a world where 
new formats have to be approved by some kind of government <laughs> body, uh, technical, like the FDA kind of thing. I mean, it does seem like oh, these things have the same, you know, I've heard that I've heard this analogy with the FDA and, um, and uh, machine learning in general, but also it just strikes me that, um, you know, having, see, part of the problem is you know, some company can just say, here's the new format, you know, and it's, you know, here's this crazy to implement impossible to check format. And, you know, that's it. And if the company becomes hugely successful, you know, like an Instagram or Facebook type of thing, you know, you just live with it. Um, so I guess it is an interesting world where when those things have huge implications, right, on people's security, on, you know, kind of uh, the longer term, um, maybe there is a different world where you have more uh, oversight uh, that's related to some kind of public entity. You know? Yeah, I, I don't see that happening in the U.S. until or unless we get to a huge crisis, which we're not we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, but part of the issue is like the you know that huge new thing that that comes wildly popular. The the company that makes it right, they're just trying to survive right at the beginning. So they're racing to produce something, and until they become wildly popular, it's irrelevant what format they have, and they're like on the bridge of death until they become wild like they, it goes from like they're completely irrelevant to they're impossible to live without in a very narrow window right and until they until they make it they don't have time to worry about things so it's like you have to make it so that good security is easy and the first thing that like so like if the tools are such like why would you write a parser by hand you obviously would right. write a grammar like you would write like the ever parse type format and then it would just generate the thing for you. And that gives you what you want. I mean, ever parse is probably is too narrow for that. But like, what if you had the, like the thing that gives you PDF or the thing that gives you whatever you want is just easier to use and better than whatever you would have done. So like the dead simple thing is the best security thing. I think that's what we should be working towards. I, I think there's some cause for optimism too. I mean, the things like, uh, you know, protobuf and flat buffer and, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, these are, these things are, are taking off uh, are quite very widely used already. Um, no one's, well, there still are, but uh, people hand rolling their data formats, but, you know, um, uh, there's a good chunk of people who are, who are using more systematic tools and that's, uh, um, it's mostly for network formats, uh, you know, rather than documents and so on, but, I wonder how often people are d devising new document formats these days. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, thanks for a great talk. Yeah, it was really interesting. Uh, I was actually had a question about, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's all this work on verified parsers that focus, I think, primarily on um, this, the, the recognition problem, you know, deciding if a, if a, if a, um, a sentence is part of the is accepted by the language. What about um, uh, what about parsing actions? Um, yeah, so uh, so the Antler, the CoStar paper that we have at PLDI actually will build a parse tree for you. Um, we're working on user defined actions to build a um, Part of the challenge of verifying is what does the actual theorem say? It's more mm -hmm. complicated to prove something. Um, uh, I think maybe like the, the hard part doesn't seem to be in that part of the puzzle, so people aren't focusing on it. But I um, like the, the the verifiers for the. Uh, uh, the the parser front end for um, the optimizing ah, C compiler. Why can't I remember the like, comp <laughs> Compsert, oh, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also is building a parse tree, right? So it's mm -hmm. not that they aren't building data structures, um, but, it, but it is related to the question that I was asking before, which is could you um, take a specification of what you wanna do and a specification of the parser and merge them together so that if you, if the reason why you had four different parsers was you're doing slightly different things with it, could you merge the downstream generator so that you get four different versions that are guaranteed to be consistent? Um, yeah, but I, I basically don't know the answer to your question. Right, I think this is, you know, uh, in, in some stuff that we've been seeing recently, this is, this is um, the construction of the parse tree itself is designed to be, you know, um, a very efficient low-level C code that's building a parse tree. 
you know, without you know trying to minimize the amount of memory allocations that are done and sort of uh, writing into an output buffer uh, that's selecting parts of the data that they care about. So even mm -hmm. so, I think sort of building the parse tree is is um, you know uh, uh, can in some cases be uh, just as much a source of problems as as um, recognizing the input. But what's the application domain for that? Networking, low level networking. Oh, yeah. Those are places where you can't just copy the buffer. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting to look at. I also like your call to arms on the on the the regex um, uh, verified low level regex library. That's um, I hope uh, some of us on the call take that as a challenge and, and yeah, and like I think we know how to do that. Like we, we I don't think it exists, but I think we have the technology. Like mm -hmm. yeah. we should be able to do that. <laughs> it's too bad we can't make money off of programming languages because like <laughs> it would be good to like make that exist and then make it available so that lots and lots of people use it so that that's what people use when they want to use a, a regular expression matcher. Yep. Uh, well, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, it, we have we have oh, just a minute or two for another question or so if anyone has uh, has one. Otherwise, I'll, I'll uh, thank Kathleen again. Thank you, Kathleen. That was that was really um, an awesome talk. Uh, you covered so much ground and um, um, and it was really inspiring too. So so thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks uh, uh, for for the next DS three session.